Hi everyone, good evening and a warm welcome uh, to those in the room and those joining us online for today's session. I'm Ahita Gangavarpu, the coordinator of Youth IG of India and also the Generation Connect Visionaries Board member at the International Telecommunications Union, ITU. Uh, I'll be the on-site moderator today uh, for this session titled Next Generation Education, Harnessing Generative AI. In education, one particular branch of AI called generative AI um, is gaining a lot of attention for its potential to revolutionize how teaching and learning practices are uh, picked up. Now, this particular session is something I very closely relate to, having recently graduated uh, from my master's and having used uh, generative AI tools uh, in academic and professional settings. I see that, um, you know, I, I definitely admire the technology for its applications and potential, but I do have personally some concerns around the use of generative AI in an educational context. Gen AI is capable of generating original content promises personalized learning experiences, and aims to improve educational outcomes. In today's intergenerational and diverse roundtable discussion, uh, we aim to answer three policy questions. Of course, in addition to understanding the importance of digital literacy, critical thinking, and ethical decision-making in the context of generative AI. For youth, what are the questions? A. What policies should be in place to ensure the responsible and ethical use of generative AI technologies in educational settings? How can policymakers collaborate with relevant stakeholders to ensure that teaching and learning processes are enhanced while sustaining creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving? How can policymakers ensure that the generative AI technology by youth in education is inclusive age appropriate and aligned with their developmental needs and abilities. Before we begin, uh, I would like to introduce the three speakers for today's discussion. Um, Donola, uh, who is the Digital Inclusion Program Officer at the United Nations International Telecommunications Union, who is joining us remotely. We have Ose, who is uh, the um, representative of Ghana Youth IGF, representing the technical community. We have Connie here. Hi, Connie. Um, she's from the ITU Generation Connect Youth Envoy from the Asia-Pacific region. Um, for today's uh, discussion, we have Gabriel Carson and Adisa joining us um, remotely as the online moderators, both from the technical community. And we have Purnima Tiwari from India Youth IGF, who is the official rapporteur for this session. Welcome, everyone. Now, we have a very interesting format for this particular session. Uh, we made sure that it's extremely interactive. It's a round table with a little bit of twist. Uh, we have made sure that there are going to be multiple interventions from your audience, and I request your active participation. Of course, keeping in time, in the mind and time, because we are really, uh, we expect really crisp responses um, and your interventions today. So, I would like to now, uh, you know, bring in Donola. Um, but actually, before bringing in Donola, I'd like to ask the audience, um, if somebody who's interested, I would request you to line up, please. What comes to your mind when you hear generative AI? What do you think is its role in education according to you? Your answer is going to set some context for today's discussion. Gen AI is a tool that is making everything easy and more accessible. And uh, it is a new way for, from, if I see it from a layman's perspective, uh, the impact that it has is making it everything accessible for everyone. Like for example, be it making music or uh, for example, I am not a photo editor. But using Gen AI, I can edit very quickly and it's very useful. So this is one impact that, one aspect of Gen AI which is impacting the public at large and uh, is worthy of a discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and I would also request you to please um, tell us your name and uh, your uh, maybe a stakeholder affiliation. Yes, please. 
Hi, Yuk Desai, uh, ISOC Youth Ambassador. I think one of the concerns related to generative AI that I've been hearing quite a lot about is plagiarism. And uh, we've seen knee-jerk reactions of people banning use of generative AI in educational institutions. Uh, but that is not really enforceable to a great degree. So I would really like if the discussion goes in that direction as well and how we can address the pro problem of plagiarism and how we can integrate generative AI uh, into the education system without worrying about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yog. Um, I would now, um, if there are no more interventions. All right, I would like to request Dunola. Um, I hope you can hear me. And I would like to ask you, uh, what is your understanding of responsible and ethical use of generative AI technologies in educational settings? And what do you think are the gaps that need to be prioritized and addressed? Thank you so much. Hopefully, um, I am audible. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for the opportunity to, to be with you today. So um, to kind of kick off, I'll share a bit about ITU, ITU's work, and then Generation Connect, what we're doing with it, and then also our collaboration with AI for Good. After that, um, unfortunately, I have to leave a bit early, but I'll leave you with, with some, some links in case any of you are interested um, in following that, that up. So the ITU is the UN agency for... Um, ICTs, we're a specialized agency. Um, our membership and our partners, we're, you know, we're fully focused um, on achieving universal, meaningful connectivity for all, particularly the um, 2.6 billion people who are currently offline with no access to the internet. So digital empowerment of young people is a major component of this vision. Um, and our youth strategy is fully aligned with the Youth 2030 strategy of the UN system. So as we all know, for us, we're talking about AI, digital is no longer something that's elective, it's a necessity. And, you know, as we saw from COVID-19, that was a defining moment in our digital history. So millions of students' education was put on hold at that time. And the global economy suffered, but of course, young people, especially those in the most vulnerable situations, suffered disproportionately during the lockdowns due to lack of digital access. So young people are digital natives and remain the driving force of connectivity. 75% um, of young people are um, online compared with 65% of the rest of the world population, but this is not uniform across all regions. For, for example, 98% um, of youth um, in Europe have access to the internet compared to just 55% um, in Africa um, where most of the LDCs are. So this session is about the next gen how the next generation connects is harnessing generative AI, but... Um, how can we even have this conversation um, when we know that so many young people um, and children are completely left out of the digital ecosystem and don't even have access to the internet? So to be able to influence and benefit from emerging technologies such as AI or have the impact on education, young people need to be connected in the first place. So fundamentally, young people, especially those in vulnerable situations, need meaningful connectivity, which means safe internet access, sustainable digital infrastructure, affordable devices, low data costs. All youth should have the access to real opportunities to develop their digital skills and engage in the overall digital development dialogue. So through Generation Connect, which is the flagship initiative of ITU's youth strategy, the ITU is directly trying to engage young people encourage their participation as equal partners alongside the leaders of today's digital change, empowering them with the skills and opportunities to advance their vision of a connected future. So um, I'm very proud as well that this session is being led and I can see many familiar faces by some of our Generation Connect Youth Envoys and board members. And it's a true testament to youth leadership um, in this space and the digital development dialogue. So to kind of round off, I would like to share with you some of the sort of concrete work that Generation Connect, having built all of that background, has done this year um, in, in partnership with AI for Good. So in case you haven't heard about it, AI for Good is a United Nations year-round digital platform where AI innovators and problem owners can learn, build, connect, and identify practical AI solutions to advance the UN SDGs. So if you've never heard of AI for Good, I'll encourage everyone to um, join, the, join the platform for free, of course, and you can access so much information, you can network and meet people who are um, also interested in the space um, and also linked with the UN. So our ongoing partnership with AI for Good is really around amplifying youth voices in this global discourse on AI. And I just want to share with you very briefly some of the things that we've done in case it might be of interest to some of you. Um, 
So we created this Generation Connect AI for Good Youth Consultation Group, and the group actually helped co-design the now live global survey on um, AI and youth, which is now available in all six UN official languages. I'm going to drop the link in the chat, and I hope all of you who haven't <laughs> completed the survey will please do so because it's helping inform our work and helping us see how young people are actually interacting with um, AI, a lot of the questions around chat GPT, education, um, generative um, AI in the education space. So it's very apt for this session. And I hope that as many of you as possible, when you complete that, we'll also leave your details at the end of the survey so we can reach out to you and you can, um, of course, you know, share more detail if, if you have strong um, thoughts on the topic. Um, we also had an AI in education webinar earlier this year on the same topic. After that, we had a podcast episode in Generation Connect. And actually, building on this effort, um, the government of Japan very kindly has sponsored one of the members of our consultation group to be at the Japan IGF right now. So he, he had his speech yesterday in a high-level panel. So this is just some of the things that we're trying to, to do with, with this group. We're, we're trying to grow the group as well to ensure that young people have a real say in this sort of AI overall global um, agenda di dialogue. So to round off, to be able to harness AI for good in educational settings and beyond, all stakeholders, including youth and children, have to have a say in the global AI agenda dialogue. Um, we can't afford to leave anyone behind in this current global context that we have right now of emergency, fragility, worsening climate crisis, the need for inclusive and innovative digital solutions have never been more urgent. And so together with diverse youth stakeholders, we must all try to co-design solutions so as trying to close the global digital divide so that connectivity for all is achieved, but also the power of technology can be properly harnessed for a more connected, prosperous and sustainable digital future for all. So I wish you all a successful session. I'm really honored to, to, to have shared space with you today. Um, and I'll leave... Um, the, the links to the things that I mentioned in the chat. And of course, if you want to get in contact with Generation Connect or, or with me, um, there's so many Generation Connect people I can see on the call, so you can reach out to any of them <laughs> um, or, or you can just email me directly. Thank you so much, Ehita, Connie and Bolitefe for this opportunity. I wish you all a great session. Thank you so much, Renola, for taking us through the efforts of ITU and also the importance of young people and their voices in um, how we want to perceive uh, AI and regulate AI moving forward, especially in an educational setting. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would now like to request or say, I see you. Hi. Um, you know, from um, your technical perspective, can you share your understanding of responsible and ethical use of generative AI technologies in educational settings, um, including uh, the role of algorithms, you know, and what do you think are the gaps that need to be addressed? Um, thank you very much. And it's been an insightful conversation so far. Wonderful presentation from Dunola. And I'd like to say my greetings from Ghana to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good, um, good day, wherever you are joining us from. And I think it's an all important conversation, one which needs to be looked at. I think we all do agree how generative AI or say AI has sort of democratized education, has made education accessible. And one thing is just we are all looking at all the promises, all the goodies, all those things, but we are just looking at the negative side. So I'll exercise brevity and go straight to the point. One is how it has become a friend yet a foe. And also how these tools have become one where it is constructed in deployment or say in developing these tools is always constructed in quite Western and wealth. And the, la the sort of trained data sets doesn't take into account certain or uh, certain minority groups. And it has become something where we need to look at. But one of these major gaps is how industry is always racing ahead of academia. Uh, it seems academia is just trotting or say just taking a sprint. And uh, here we have uh, um, uh, industry taking that wild chase and there seems to be, we need to find that kind of mutual or say that line of uh, best fit where we can find a common ground in deployment and um, development of these tools. Um, so issue of safety, issue of bias, issue of accountability all do come in, onto the fore. But one thing that is in deployment or say, or these algorithms or these training, these data sets, it needs to take a human centric approach. That's my view or 
where we uh, most countries need to take a human centered approach. Uh, we've seen other state, uh, other states, or say other um, organization taking an approach which leaves much to be desired for. But with the human centric approach, it takes into account that of safety, they take that account of trust, and um, it, it captures everything. Or I know the conversation, our website brevity here, and I'll let my other speakers come in and we will see to advance the conversation. So that's a brief remark from me. Thank you so much, Jose, for your remarks. Um, in the interest of time, we'll just jump to Connie and take her inputs, you know, as a young person and um, a student, what is your understanding of the same? And uh, what do you see are some of the major benefits and concerns around generative AI? Thank you, Hita. So generative AI technologies in educational settings, especially from the perspective of young students like us, are truly exciting and it holds immense promise. And this field of innovation has the potential to completely reshape how we approach teaching and how we approach learning. But with any sort of groundbreaking development, there's always a need to take a balanced view. And considering both the incredible benefits and also the important concerns that come with it. So when we talk about generative AI in education, one of the most striking things is the potential for personalization. I mean, as a 22-year-old biomedical engineering student myself, I have felt the difference in how quickly I grasp certain concepts and the unique ways I prefer to learn. And generative AI could be a real game changer here because it's like having a virtual tutor that tailors everything to your specific needs by generating custom content, quizzes and exercises, ensuring that your learning journey matches your individual pace and preferences perfectly. And generative AI can also knock down some of the long-standing barriers in education. For example, language-wise, it can break language barriers by translating lectures into different languages, making learning more inclusive and accessible globally. And also, disability-wise, for those with hearing or visual impairments, this technology could generate real-time transcripts or provide audio descriptions of notes, making learning an enriching experience for everyone. Now I'm also painfully aware of the student life hustle, and I'm sure that many of us students find ourselves juggling with various roles, including being student assistants and peer mentors. So generative AI can also be very helpful here as well, because it can handle the tedious administrative tasks like grading assignments, managing schedules, and also answering other students' common queries. This means that there's more time for us to focus on our own studies, have a better study work-life balance, maybe some more time to procrastinate and connect with our peers, thereby reducing the stress of multitasking. And however, as promising as all of this sounds, it's of course important to address the concerns as well. One significant issue is the misuse of this technology. Sadly, some individuals have used generative AI to create misinformation, leading to fake research papers and misleading information. And this misinformation can harm students who unknowingly rely on it for their studies, which will not be good for anyone's education moving forward. And another concern is the risk of becoming too dependent on AI. While it is convenient, a bit too convenient really, to use generative AI for assignments and projects, this over-reliance could hinder the development of students' critical thinking and creativity, which are all crucial skills. So it's very essential for students to be aware of this and learn to strike a balance between using AI co for convenience and also nurturing their own abilities. And privacy is, of course, another big issue. It's not just limited to young people and students. Generative AI often needs access to lots and lots of data, including personal information. And mishandling this data could lead to breaches and misuse, which potentially compromises our privacy and security. So it's always important to stay vigilant about how our personal information is handled, but also at the same time, we should learn how to protect our own information to the best that we can when using generative AI. And also lastly, uh, one thing that I can think of is the issue of bias. So AI systems can inherit biases present in their training data, which perpetuates stereotypes and discrimination, which are actually a serious ethical concern. So as students, it is on us to be vigilant to identify and address bias in AI systems to ensure fair and inclusive learning. 
So overall, yes, generative AI is a powerful tool in education, and it shouldn't be regarded as either inherently good or bad. And to make the most of its benefits while minimizing concerns, we need responsible and also ethical usage because ultimately the aim is to enhance the learning experience, safeguard privacy, nurture critical thinking, and promote fairness and inclusivity in education. Back to you, Ihita. Great points, Connie. Thank you so much for taking us through your uh, experience um, with the benefits as well as some major concerns around critical thinking, uh, bias, and a lot more. Um, so now I'll, I'd like to open up the floor for audience intervention uh, where we'd like to like your inputs on um, the policy question, which is what policy should be in place to ensure the responsible and ethical use of generative AI technologies in educational settings? Um, please, the floor is open for your remarks. Uh, I would also request Adisa in case there are any online interventions to, um, yeah, to, to let me know. Uh, thank you. This is Atanas Pahizire. Youth Ambassador for, uh, for the record. Uh, when it comes to the regulation, uh, now everybody tends to think about the policy and regulation we need to do and to take around uh, uh, AI. I think the right regulation now is the one that uh, does not hinder innovation and also uh, allow uh, good data, a lot good data transfer. When we think about regulating AI, we should also think about the movement of data. Since uh, Connie mentioned, uh, there is really uh, having a good AI is also having a lot of data behind. So the good regulation will be the one that's really considered that data transfer and also does not hinder innovation. Uh, that it for me, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Athanis. Um, so good regulation is something that does not hinder innovation. So something, thank you. Um, are there any more interventions on what policies do you feel um, are the need of the hour around this topic? Hi, I'm Pranav. I'm a student of law. And uh, I've been thinking about uh, use of generative AI. And I, before we go into the policy aspects, I've been thinking that there's need for more experimenting on what are the use cases of using generative AI in academic settings. For example, I found it very useful in doing certain analysis. At, so it's not about making uh, just copying your work or plagiarizing, but using it for critical thinking at scale. You have designed something and you have, you've, you've gotten the right model and now you are uh, giving your work to a, uh, to a machine to complete it for you. And I think that you should be permitted because we do utilize different machines and softwares for our analysis, especially when we are doing empirical work. So the fact that most use of Gen AI in academic circles is considered, is seen from the lens of plagiarism, is, uh, is in my view not very good, and uh, more experimenting and open discussions, and, and this is where uh, PhD guides and, and, and uh, guides for the master's students should be having more open, frank discussions with the larger teams and the ethical committees of the relevant universities so that more experiment can be done, and flaws can be understood and, and thereafter uh, these pr challenges can be resolved. I hope this helps. Thank you so much, Prana, for sharing those points. Um, if, are there any more policy interventions that are required? All right, so yes, please, please. Hello, I'm Tapani Tarvanen from Finland. And looking at this from teacher's perspective, although I'm not now a teacher, but I have been, and basically there's no point in 
regulating it out all. Okay, I'm looking at the university level. I'm not saying at lower level, maybe. But uh, it's just like I remember when pocket calculators came about and there was horror, you know, people will cheat in math exams and so. But all these techniques will be used anyway. And exams should be designed so to deal with the reality of what people will be doing outside them anyway. And I have been doing exams in the past using computers. which all you can do anything with them except talk to each other. If you Google, cool. I'll take allow for it when designing that exam. That's so it's Googleable. Okay, my bad. Same way thing with AI. If you can answer that with AI, okay, I should have allowed for that and tried it myself before doing it. So maybe a regulation to require teachers to take this into account would be useful. Thank you so much for your points. Hi, Please. Yoga again, ISOC Youth Ambassador. Uh, I've been thinking of this from a Global South perspective, and uh, I think that while we try to make internet more accessible to people in rural areas in the Global South, uh, some thought should be given to how generative AI can be used in education in the rural areas in Global South, because uh, the quality of teaching that is accessible to uh, children in these areas is quite limited, and I think that generative AI can really help bridge this gap that we're seeing in, in the Global South. So that is something that people should consider. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is uh, Valeris. I'm currently also a student. I'm doing my master's degree in informatics, and I'm concentrating on more on data science. So my question, and maybe kind of way a little bit of thinking regarding the AI, um, like students, they're still gonna use it. You cannot ban it outright. It should be allowed in my perspective, but we need to think about the way how we can govern it, for example, for the exams, because, you know, I can generate a code, I can write it with the, just with ChatGPT right now, I can build a site like in a matter of five seconds, and another five seconds I'm gonna spend just to input the code, and then I'm gonna see my website, which is, did I do it? No. Um, the um, artificial intelligence, the text generation performed it for me. And the question is, you can write an essay, you can write whatever you want with it, and the model is gonna become more and more uh, complex, it's gonna become more bigger, therefore it's going to become, improve, it's gonna improve it on itself. So uh, we need to think about some kind of a policies that will prevent um, people using AI on the exams, not to cheat, but in order to get the skill. Um, so I think we need some kind of a universal like policy in between in the university and academia to uh, have it the field level down. For example, in the EU, you have uh, certain uh, levels um, of education around the European Union, but the education level is different. Uh, in the different countries, so we just need to think about something that will prevent people using uh, AI um, during the examination period. So it's open, you can use it, but you know, at the end of the exam, it's you and your personal skills that this should be important in, in my understanding. So thank you for your attention. Yes, please, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to just add a few things. Uh, from the teacher's perspective, uh, I think uh, the tool certainly is useful for the students uh, because it, it enhances their creativity and the critical thinking. For, but from the teacher's perspective, I mean, you are going to grade uh, submissions which are done in, let's say, in five seconds. So we, we need to find a way where we can evaluate those, those kind of submissions or some kind of evaluation rubrics, I think. We need to start thinking about how we evaluate those work and if there are any, I mean, uh, ways to integrate like a uh, digital watermarking where it is clear to the teacher that some of the contents are coming from AI sources and that helps the teachers to actually to see how well the students are doing. So I think uh, that would be something that we could, we could discuss also. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much for all your interventions. Um, they're noted and I think we'll take it up, take up a few comments from the speakers towards the end of the session on the interventions. Um, moving ahead, I would actually um, request Connie uh, to talk about how do you think policymakers should and can collaborate with relevant stakeholders um, to ensure that teaching and learning processes are enhanced while sustaining creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. You mentioned these terms 
during your uh, initial uh, talk, so please. Thank you. So as a student who's been through the educational landscape of Asia, um, let's take a moment to delve into what integrating generative AI into education here really means. So Asia, as you probably know, is a vast continent boosting like a huge array of different countries, each with its own unique educational systems, cultures, languages, and so on. And given this remarkable diversity, any discussion around introducing generative AI in education needs to begin by recognizing and embracing this fact, especially like some of the uh, audience members have just mentioned, especially in assessments and in exams. So other than that, policymakers also need to get a solid grip on what generative AI is all about, because without a clear understanding of this technology, any strategies that they devise might actually miss the mark already. So it's crucial for policymakers to educate themselves on the intrinsic keys of uh, generative AI, which could be done through collaboration with experts and researchers in the field. And once policymakers have this firm grasp, their next big task is to decide how to prioritize its integration into education. So it's all about finding that sweet spot between leveraging that power of generative AI into, um, to enhance education while safeguarding and, if possible, enhancing essential skills like critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving. And achieving this balance is obviously not easy, and it requires active engagement with educators, students, and parents to gather valuable insights and ensure that technology enriches the en educational experience rather than replacing these vital human skills. And now when it comes to actually putting these plans to action, inclusivity actually takes a very important role here because collaborating with various stakeholders in education, such as teachers, parents, tech companies, and students is very important. And together they can identify and tackle issues like accessibility, uh, algorithmic biases, and also the digital divide, and ultimately make sure that generative AI enhanced education is accessible to everyone, regardless of their background. And to make this implementation a success, educators need to be well equipped to make the most out of AI tools. So this means that policymakers have to promote partnerships with teacher training institutions and education technology companies to provide ongoing professional development and support. And by doing so, educators are empowered to try and fully harness the potential of AI in the classroom. And ethical concerns such as privacy, bias, and data security these should not be brushed aside. Uh, policymakers need to team up with data protection authorities and educators to establish clear guidelines for the ethical use of AI in education. And these guidelines should ensure that student data is safeguarded and AI algorithms remain free from bias and also data security should be very rock solid. And also furthermore, Academic researchers and institutions can play a vital role in evaluating the impact and ethical implications of AI in education. So by collaborating with them to conduct regular assessments and research initiatives, this could provide valuable insights that policymakers can use to make informed decisions. Collaborations with universities and tech startups, uh, ideally incentivized by government funding, can also motivate the development of new ethically sound AI learning tools, which could in turn enrich the educational landscape as well. And lastly, let's not forget about the global perspective as a whole. Policymakers should consider collaborating with other countries and also other regions, sharing best practices and setting common standards for the ethical and effective use of AI in education. So in our interconnected world, international cooperation is the key to addressing common challenges and also ensuring that the responsible and ethical use of generative AI in education benefits students from all across the world. So overall, the responsible and ethical use of generative AI in education is a multifaceted challenge that demands collaboration among diverse stakeholders. And while navigating this complex terrain may be challenging, I believe that the potential benefits for education make it a worthwhile endeavor that can ultimately enhance the learning experiences for students all across the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gani. It was a very comprehensive response. Love it. <laughs> Um, I would now like to uh, invite Adisa, uh, who is also the online moderator, but wants his to give his interventions as an attendee. Adisa, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Aisa. Um, uh, right now, we don't have any questions from the online attendees. Um, by the way, I'm Adisa Bolutife. Um, I'm a member of the Generation Connects Visionaries Board, and 
also glad to be here as an online moderator. So um, my, I also have a personal input. So I would like to add to what some of the attendees already pointed out, but I, I, I think I would focus more on um, the potential of generative AI, because I think um, while we have a lot of things to worry about, it's also like um, a huge um, potential for um, growth. And if we see the convergence of um, education and artificial intelligence really has given rise to a lot of innovative possibilities, especially in the educational sector, we now see situations where um, there's more immersive learning through um, things like, um, you know, physical sort of training that that directly addresses people's cognitive abilities, uh, which I think is really good, especially for children, because um, the usual way of teaching probably would change in the coming years. And I think rather than regulate um, generative AI down, I think um, academia should probably learn how to work with it because um, I feel instead of banning students from using ChatGPT or whatever, um, technologies out there, um, the curriculum perhaps needs to upgrade or needs to evolve to address real world, real world um, issues. Because at the end of the day, when they leave the, the academic environment, they will still use these technologies. They probably won't have to do those things manually anymore. So perhaps you test um, the knowledge in other ways, and we just need to evolve with um, the current scale at which artificial intelligence is moving. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I think less regulation is a good thing. Um, and it also creates more room for innovation. Um, with this, I'd like to give the floor back to Ahita. And if there are any other questions online, I'll be sure to bring them to your notice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Molotife. Um, and I think there, were, there was a couple of more mentions about how you, we need to do the assessment testing uh, and research and how it's going to impact instead of uh, completely uh, you know, removing generative AI from, let's say, a young person's life in an educational context. Um, but uh, now, now I'd like to invite Ose uh, to answer the same question. You know, how can policymakers collaborate uh, with relevant stakeholders when it comes to teaching and learning processes, uh, enhancing of these processes, uh, while making sure we're sustaining creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving? I think this question has lingered on for years. Policy makers and all converging with industry or say that of the technical community in enhancing these tools. But the fact is that day in, day out, they are going to be new tools, they are going to be new technologies. So we need to embrace these new technologies. And there have or say consistently, there have been these guardrails in place, but how are we implementing them? Because new technologies do come up, there's call for you know, there's call for policy, there's call for guardrails and all those things. But how about previous uh, policies or say initiatives or say guardrails concerning these things? I am of the belief that we need to regulate AI and all these things because we see complex say design systems like the nuclear reactions and all those things, having certain guardrails, we can't let the journey out of the bus, even though it may be out of the bus. And we can't wait to say that uh, we need to be ahead of the curve to have all these regulations in a way that we don't stifle or say hinder innovation. We need to find that line of best fit. And I've always maintained that in collaboration or say with academia or say industry or say policymakers, it needs to take an unappending philosophy or say ideology, which is human centric. I've always believed that if we are deploying these or say these technologies, and we're talking about ethics, if it takes a human centric approach, all these issues must be solved. As I already mentioned, there are always going to be new technologies here. So how about instead of transcending humanity, how about being we being human in our designs, instead of say colonizing, how about we coexisting? Because some of these two sort of colonize, we've seen in copious academic literatures where deployment of tools to check anti-plagiarism or say academic integrity exhibit bias against non-English speakers. 
So it sort of take that nuance and we need to, there's that race of deployment of that these tools sort of colonize. So instead of boundless expansion, how about enough? These tools may be fine too, but we seem to be developing new tools which sort of exhibit biases. So instead of transformative artificial intelligence, how about tools for humans, which is going to make us more effective? So um, I, I do believe essentially uh, we need to take a human centric approach and we need to be effective collaboration from academia and multiple stakeholder groups. Over to you, Ihita. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, actually, uh, just now following up uh, on the points that were mentioned by Connie, uh, Disa, and Jose, I would like to now open the floor for an audience, for the audience intervention. Now, the policy question that we are trying uh, to get your inputs on is how can policymakers ensure that the use of generative AI by the young people in education is inclusive, age appropriate, and aligned with their developmental? needs and abilities? I think it's a really important question for us to think about. Um, you know, there, there were some, in the, one of the previous meetings that I had an opportunity to attend, um, they were talking about how you can have some kind of content, content moderation or parental controls. Um, so there are lots of aspects to it. So we'd like to hear from you um, what should be, what, what, what is it that we should be doing um, moving forward? Thank you very much for organizing this session. Um, I'm a high school teacher in Tokyo, and I think AI has a good potential to raise global citizens. And I think teachers, international students together, and also researchers design, try designing good uh, curriculum uh, to actually deliver AI-supported class curriculums together in a human-centric way, and we will see whether AI is ethical and it's transparent, and students and teachers and researchers will judge whether it has the ability to promote the good part of the student all over the world. Thank you. Great points, thank you. Um, are there any more interventions? Uh, hi, my name is Nicolina. Um, I'm a first year student here in Kyoto studying information processing. Um, my main thing that I think is really important in policy making is that the policy making reflects the fact that AI is going to change academia because I think if the policy making reflects, it is trying to just maintain the status quo academia as it is today, I think it will fail to uh, integrate AI successfully. And I hope that the policy making will reflect the fact that AI is going to change academia, is going to change education. Um, yeah, that's what I hope for policy making. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much. I like that there's a mix of teachers, professors, and students in the audience. Um, but it, it, it's a very important uh, discussion. So if there are any more interventions, not, not just from speaker, you know, just teachers and students, but if there's, I can also see and identify a few members of the technical community here. So if you have any interventions, please share your policy recommendations. Right. Uh, so again, Valerie's. Uh, I'm just like thinking if we're going to speak about uh, usage of the generative AI and with concern with the kids, because currently like everybody is speaking about the chat GPT or uh, other uh, generators that were created. So who's gonna create, the f my first like f kind of point of thinking, who's gonna create something for the kids? Is there's gonna be a responsibility for the financial company to do it? 
or is it going to be the governmental responsibility to do it because we are going to speak about the education because nowadays uh, like the generative AI and all this text recognition and uh, visual recognition it's um, practically it's used for the education but right now it's uh, become a huge thing in for example company uh, life uh, like uh, automation of tasks but like who's really going to do it and uh, where there will be incentives for the huge companies to do it or we should rely only on their goodwill and what uh, about the data that is going to be used to teach uh, those uh, um, AI algorithms and teach uh, those specifically for children because nowadays well, like uh, open ed they just scratch a lot of website a lot of data information then put it together and started learning from that but inside of this data there is already uh, a bias uh, that nobody could check because it's so much information was fed to the algorithms so who's going to do it and it's going to be costly who's so who's going to bear the costs uh, will it be the private sector will it be the taxpayers or uh, who's going to pay for the, this this entire thing we i think we also need to think about that if we really want to make something for the ch children and their education. Thank you. That's a fair point. <laughs> oh. Are there any more interventions? So we're looking at, you know, we're looking at inclusion, one, age appropriate um, generative AI and aligned with developmental needs and abilities. So I think these are the three verticals that we're trying to highlight and think through in this intervention. Thank you. This is Atanas again. Uh, one thing when we are thinking about inclusion in AI, I think we should uh, go back again to the data that are being fed to the AI. So now uh, when we are using this generative AI, you realize that uh, the data, ten, like the response you are getting tends to be oriented to uh, the West or to some cultures uh, where you can first you can't use it in some languages, uh, whether our local languages or some other, maybe regional languages, but that are not English and uh, not uh, related to some some regions. So what I've realized is that uh, the data we are getting tends to relate to the developer of the AI tool. And uh, most of these are developed by the big techies, and you, uh, whether based in the US or in the Europe. So you see, they have uh, already this pre-definition. So when we are looking up, uh, at inclusion, we also need to look at that. We need, when we need inclusive AI, we also need uh, AI developed uh, in other countries, in other regions. So I think when, uh, we are looking at it from the academia, like as I'm a software engineer, but also a student. So when I'm looking at it, I think we need to develop our own systems that are based uh, are learning from our data and uh, that also can relate to our cultures, to our regions. And then there we can talk about inclusion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atenis. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I'm Iso Matsunami from Japan. I'm I may be too old to talk about English uh, education, but I I wonder uh, education with generative AI at current level might be uh, end in a very strong uh, English centrism. Um, um, uh, in the end, you uh, uh, you are saying that hey, hey, everybody can uh, run English, master English with generative AI, but no, nobody, nobody talk about your own native language. Even in Japan, I I wondered even in Japan we cannot make. A Japanese generative AI software. It's it's a very uh, English centric or American centric. 
uh, every every people in uh, Asia, we have small, very small uh, language groups, and uh, I want that they can, or even Japanese can have our own generative AI system, especially as education. Thank you so much. I think there were some mentions of uh, use cases also, and I think that is something for us to very uh, for us to consider. And thank you for sharing the point on uh, inclusion. Also in involves language. Um, are there any more interventions? I think we'll be happy to take one more. Sorry, please, please. So, my name is Patrick Paul Walsh. Um, I'm from the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, so I'm also a professor in University College Dublin. Um, so one thing I think that's important here is we, we have to realize it's not just about getting access to the internet and learning how to use this and use these platforms and technologies. The one problem you've got to think about is what's called open education resources. So the freedom to actually have resources create it and quality assured and put on, that's called the global knowledge commons, which could be the internet. Um, and of course, lots of countries have great teachers, great curriculums, great applications to the domestic context, but they're not online. So, you know, if you really are going to apply this tool and know there's biases in the data that it's drawing from, you've got to be very concerned that that data pool, the great lake of that knowledge is not being populated in general Right, right across the world um, in terms of education resources. So that's why the UNESCO Open Education Recommendation, Open Science Recommendations, and Open Data Recommendations are so important because it's not just about use, it's about the right to populate the Global Knowledge Commons uh, with all of this sort of resource and material. And, and that needs a lot of work from policy, from tech people, you know, universities, governments, and so on. Thank you very much, all of you, for your interventions. Uh, they're duly noted. Uh, now, we would like to move to the last segment where I'd like to invite uh, Use to share his um, you know, couple of minutes to talk about the question that we had just uh, raised, and also your closing remarks since we're running short of time. <laughs> yeah, sure. So our website's brevity since um, time is our biggest enemy. One thing is that we need to, we all agree now, is how Generative AI has sort of created personalized learning materials. It has made learning easy and all that. But there are some myths around these things we need to. And I think some of our um, participants over there raise it. How we talk of how these generative AI tools has made education democratized, but truly it isn't democratized. It is sort of centered around certain languages around it's all more eurocentric america centric and all so it, it for it to be truly democratized we all need to benefit japanese africa everywhere and two is how when you talk of policies and making policies and uh, initiatives or say national strategies i truly wish that when you go back from our, our respective countries we advocate for national uh, strategies or ai policies strategies and policies we need guardrails we can't let the journey out of the bus. We need to be ahead of the curve. There, there are always going to millions and thousands of these tools, but how do we make it safe? How do we make it, uh, can we trust these tools? How can we, can it be open and accountable? And lastly, uh, when I do talk about um, in deployment, I will say of these tools, how in designing these tools, how, you need to take an approach of, approach of human centric. I can't stress this enough. We can make all the policies, but if in designing all these tools, it doesn't take the human centric approach, we, we may be failing and all. So there must be that kind of synergistic energy to collaboration from academia. Um, just like we are here, the multi stakeholder approach in designing these tools. And it's been a, such an uh, it, it, enriching conversation. And uh, which seeks to inform, and I'm very privileged to hear, and I have learned a lot here. And I would love to hear from Punima, who is also on the call. And uh, I'll give my one minute to uh, Punima to also say something on that. 
Right. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I think that's sort of uh, last minute inputs, but yeah, uh, thanks for saying for this. I probably, I mean, um, uh, it's an interesting conversation. I think I would certainly would want to contribute in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, some ideas on how can we make it more inclusive. Of course, I think uh, uh, making those data models are enrich, enriching them, of course, uh, would be to, you know, look at different sets of, uh, uh, and, and, and address different sets of concerns on, 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 you know, the multi uh, ethnic cities and all the challenges that can come along with it. And, you know, the, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the concerns that Connie has raised about privacy and how can we safeguard it alongside. So I guess, you know, in the current digital world, everybody sort of, um, uh, you know, more on it and using more of these platforms. I think it's very important to build on a strong infrastructure alongside. So, yeah, I think that that would be my submission. Yeah. Thank you, Purnima. Thank you, Osei, for your comments. Uh, I will now uh, request Connie to share her closing remarks and addressing the policy question. Okay, so I guess to sum it up, first off, collaboration is inevitable. Policymakers, educators, tech developers, and any other relevant stakeholders should form a team, and such collaboration should extend beyond occasional meetings and instead to involve into an ongoing dialogue, just like how AI technologies are constantly evolving and our policies have to keep up to this pace. And the next is data protection. Since AI is becoming more and more prominent in our education, we need better and more robust data protection laws. And these laws are essential to ensure that students' personal information remains secure while they engage and interact with AI-powered educational tools. And we have to mention digital literacy programs as well. Before students dive into the world of AI, they need a solid understanding of digital concepts. And such knowledge empowers them to critically assess AI-generated content and navigate the digital realm with confidence. So if policymakers put more focus into digital literacy, young people could be equipped with the skills to think twice before consuming online information and perceiving them as right or wrong. And also this brings us to inclusivity, be it language and knowledge sources, like some of the audience has mentioned. Policymakers should recognize the immense potential of AI in addressing educational disparities by personalizing learning experiences, tailoring content to individual needs, and also accommodating diverse languages, learning styles, and paces. This inclusivity-driven approach ensures that AI serves as a bridge and not a barrier in education. And also policymakers should also adopt a proactive stance on assessing the impact of AI on students and by collaborating with researchers. This could shed light on how AI affects students in the short and long term, including uh, skills like cognitive development, social skills, and so on. And finally, to ensure the use of generation Generative AI by youth in education is all right. Young people themselves should be actively involved in these policy making issues because we have the unique insights based on our first hand experiences and preferences, and policymakers should tap into this knowledge and also include it into their policies. So, I guess to conclude, generative AI will inevitably be integrated into education. So, policymakers should lead the charge of responsible AI integration in education by setting clear guidelines promoting digital literacy, addressing educational disparities, encouraging AI development, and involving young voices in the decision-making processes. And with these comprehensive steps, we can definitely shape an educational landscape where generative AI becomes a powerful ally of ours. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, you know, with this, we reach towards the end of the session. First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for your active interventions, because it's uh, we are at the IGF to discuss, ideate, and hopefully come up with effective actions on how we would like to meaningfully have, um, you know, have meaningful policies around uh, the use of generative AI uh, and in an educational setting. So yes, with every emerging technology, there are con concerns surrounding um, multiple concerns, and especially with generative AI, we spoke about bias and fairness, the type of content, challenges of misinformation, issues of copyright, and more. So there are lots of thoughts and inputs that are needed. And like Connie mentioned, let us work together in leveraging generative AI and bridging the gaps in education. Thank you very much, and have a great day ahead. <laughs>